It's getting to be Christmas time and the podium is decorated with all kinds of things to trip over. <laughs> it's good to be back with you all. I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. Your assignment was to find some joy. I hope you did a little bit of that and ate a little bit too much. Uh, my joy this last week, uh, I got to spend some time with the staff here at uh, Skillman and got to visit with them and just say a word about that whenever churches are in transition the workload stays the same it just falls on fewer and fewer people and the staff that's working here is just doing a tremendous job so if you haven't taken a moment just to thank them for the hard work they're doing be sure to do that because we really appreciate them very very much and and they're really doing a great job the other thing i got to do was go with ruth ann and do a tour of the cdc and um you know, I'm already intimidated because I was in this, she has this lab, this computer lab for these kids that aren't in school yet, and I couldn't do what's in that computer lab. I mean, it's amazing what's going on there. So really enjoyed that time with you and your staff and getting to go through the school. It's just tremendous. So blessings to you guys and the staff as well as we move forward. Two weeks ago, we began talking about um, the book of Philippians, and we did a preliminary on that. Paul was in house prison. He was in chains, probably in Rome. He gets word that the first church in Europe he'd established in the town of Philippi is having some problems. There was some conflict there, and so he sends him a letter, and in the first chapter of that letter, he offers a prayer, and that prayer says, I, I need you guys to have some love, I need you to think real carefully about the things that you're um, using discernment on. Have some discernment. Use some good judgment. And the third thing he says in that prayer is, I, I need you to think about the way you're behaving in front of the community that you're a part of. At the end of the letter, we discover the reason why he writes those words. It's because there's two women that are there, Euodia and Syntyche, in chapter 4, that have gotten into some kind of conflict. And that conflict is significant enough that it is spread throughout the church. It's gotten significant enough that it is spread out into the community and it's damaging the reputation of that church to such an extent that Paul has to write them a letter. And we normally turn to Philippians as a devotional book and pull out verses about joy, which is okay to do. But if you understand the flow of Philippians, Philippians is a book that's saying to these folks, I know you're not very happy right now. I know things are not going very smoothly. So let's address how you can get some joy back into your life. We doing okay? Is that enough of a review? Okay. I know you slept since then. And for those of you that weren't here two weeks ago, that's kind of what we did. I teach a course over at the university uh, in conflict resolution. It's a capstone course for master's degree students and they have a textbook and lectures and I'd like to think that we do a lot of good work with them in there. But if I could just give them chapters 2 and 3 in Philippians, slide it to them and say, take a look at what it, Paul is saying to this church, you'd have a pretty good approach to how to resolve conflict. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at chapters 2 and 3 and one passage in 4 and look at Paul's prescription to this little church, some things he says about how you manage conflict. Because I do this all the time. I do it with couples in counseling. I do it in churches. I do it with university settings. Conflict is just something a part of our lives. So how we resolve that is very, very important. I'm going to begin in Philippians chapter 2, begin reading in verse 1, and we'll do our first Oh, I'm getting in the sermon. I totally forgot my first two slides. Guys at the back, I'm so sorry. I was supposed to talk about the CHA. I just got so excited about Philippians, I just totally flew over my introduction. It's hard to get good help. <laughs> the CHA starts today. You see it up there. We're going to be doing this over the next three Sundays. Um, it, is, it is a survey that's going to give us basically an x-ray on how we're doing as a church. It's going to measure uh, kind of the health of the congregation in nine different areas. You're going to get an email in your inbox. That's why we need your email address. Uh, there's going to be a link there that's going to take you into the survey. 
It takes about mm, 10 to 15 minutes to fill out. Um, all of the answers are completely confidential. I don't see them. Uh, they go straight to the Cyber Institute that's going to compile them and then give us back a report. So we'd like for you to take the time to do that this next week. If you're having problems on that, or you need any help, or you're not a technology person, we'll have some tablets next week set up, ready, and some people to help you do that. If you're old school and need paper pencil, we got you covered. I got a paper version of it for those of you that want to actually feel your responses. Okay, we got you on that. So we'd like for everybody to participate that. We'll be pulling that together. There's also a place for you to do write-in comments as well. So you can answer the questions, but then you can write in your comments as well. So we want everybody to do that. Shailene, did I cover everything on that? Yes. Good. Can I go back to Philippians? Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Let's go back to Philippians now. Chapter 2 and verse 1. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, any, any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded and having the same love, being one in spirit and in purpose. The first hint or the first suggestion that the Apostle Paul makes to the Philippians is when you're crossways with somebody else, he says, don't throw the good stuff out with the bad. In other words, the first thing he says is here, I want you to be thinking about encouragement. I want you to be thinking about comfort from love. I want you to be thinking about fellowship in the Spirit. I want you to be thinking about compassion. When I'm upset with somebody, the last thing I want to be thinking about related to that person is how good I feel about them and how I wish them well and I hope they have a nice holiday. No, I hope a sleigh runs over them and reindeer poop on their porch. You know, it's like, no, I want bad stuff to happen to you. And Paul is saying to him here, I need you to not throw the baby out with the bathwater when you're upset at somebody else because there may be some good stuff about them that you've what? Forgotten about. We have, an, we, ha we have in conflict a tendency to what we call in, in the counseling profession painting someone black. Painting black is where I just decide everybody, everything about that person is bad and evil and not any good, and I just need to write them off. And so something good happens to that individual, and my posture toward that is, well, I could tell you a thing or two about them. I, I could straighten you out about them. You don't know the person I know. And, and that's what's going on in Philippi. Yodi is painting Syntyche black, Syntyche's painting Yodia black, and the thing is getting what? Better or worse by the day? Yeah, it's getting worse by the day. And so he's saying, I need you not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There might be some good things about this other person that your feelings are not able to see at this moment in time. And he does something real interesting here. It's not written this way in your English Bible, but it is in the original Greek. In the original Greek, it reads, I want you to be of the same mind with the same love of the same mind of the same mind. Three times he says, be of the same mind. In English, we don't do it that way. We've got to change things up. In Greek, when they wanted to emphasize something, they wouldn't underline it. In English, we underline it. In Greek, that's how they erase things. They didn't know how to do good English back then. In Greek, they would say it over and over again. So in the original Greek, it reads, I want you to be of the same mind, with the same love, the same mind, and the same mind. So what he's saying here is, I need you all to get together on this thing and be viewing one another in at least somewhat of a positive light. So he says, don't throw everything out that's bad about everybody else. There may be some good there. We doing okay with that one? Okay, let's roll then to verse 3. He continues, um, verse 3, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility considers others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only for your own interest, 
but also for the interests of others. The second thing that he says here, he says, you don't have to like somebody in order to love them. Let me say that one again, because that messes with your brain, doesn't it? You don't have to like somebody to love them. I'll give you a for instance here. Jesus didn't like the religionists. He called them a bunch of snakes. He told them he was a bunch of hypocrites. In fact, he did it seven times. He didn't like them. But did he love them? Well, of course. He liked Lazarus. He liked Mary. He liked Martha. He liked John. He liked a lot of folks. But he didn't care for those religionists. He thought they were a bunch of snakes. So what happens then is, a lot of times, when I get crossways with somebody, I don't want to treat them in a loving way because I don't what? I don't like them. I don't like them. I get couples in that I work with all the time, and they've been arguing about stuff, and she doesn't particularly care for him anymore, and he said some terrible things about her and hurt her feelings, and they're just all gnarled up and crossways with one another. And the first thing that I have to do is to get them to agree to act in a caring way toward one another. So I assign her some caring things, because she'll look at me and she said, I don't like him, I don't love him, I don't want anything to do with him. Okay, I get it. Could you act in a caring way toward him? Well, I guess so. You know, could you act in a caring way toward her? If I have to. We're paying for this, I guess I better do it. Okay. That's what, that's, what, that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying to these folks that are crossways at Philippi, he's saying, I know we don't like each other right now, but I need you to look out for the best interest of this other person. Wow. Because if we, if we go over to Ephesians, Ephesians, I think it's 5 and verse 1, says, Submit to one another out of reverence for whom? Christ. The bottom line is, the way I get along with another person in Christ is mutual submission. And that's what he's saying here. He's saying, look out for the best interest of one another. And in this church, Euodia was looking out for her interests, and she had her friends around her that felt sorry for her. Syntyche was looking out for her best interests, and she had her little group around. And the two of them had gone to war with one another. And he's saying, I need to reverse that. I need you all, y'all don't like each other right now, but I need you to act in a Christian way that is loving toward one another, which means you can both be caring toward each other and look out for each other's best what? Best interests. Hard or easy? That's hard stuff to do. Yeah, you're, you're sitting out there going, this is not easy stuff to do. I know. I know. This is graduate level Christianity. This is following the cross. This is not showing up at church and just kind of doing religion here. This is walking after the master. It's tough stuff. Number three, let's continue reading in chapter two. He says in verse five, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Now, we've used this, I mean, I grew up going to chapel. I went to Dallas Christian, we had chapel five days a week, went to Abilene, we had chapel all the time, church three times a week. I've been in enough chapel and devotional talks to last five lifetimes. And this text is the most often used text in devotional talks. People pull it out and use it all the time. And they'll use the text, which is, have the attitude of Jesus, which is great. It makes for a great chapel talk. But it's not exactly what he's talking about here. Why? Because in the original language, there's a demonstrative pronoun. And if your Bible doesn't read, have this mind or have this attitude, 
It's missing the demonstrative pronoun, which is fine. You can keep your Bible. Don't go throw it away. But I'm just saying there's a pronoun that's real important. What he's saying is there's a particular form of Jesus' approach to life that is critically important to this little church. And he's saying the attitude or the mind, this mind that Jesus had, stepped into this mess that was humanity, that was the world, that was caught in conflict. God was separated from man because of sin, and the only reconciliation to that was the cross of Christ. And it's saying here that Christ emptied of himself and stepped into this mess that was us in order to facilitate reconciliation. What did he do? One word, vulnerable. He got vulnerable, and it got him killed. And that's what we're so afraid of when we're in conflict with somebody else is, if I get vulnerable with that other person, then I can get hurt, or I can get hurt again. And when we're hurt, the first thing we do is we grab, and we hold, and we protect. And it's real interesting. There's a famous marriage and family therapist from the Dallas area, Harville Hendricks. And he wrote back in the 80s a book called Getting the Love You Want. And it talks about how to have a mature Christian love. And in that he says that the, the route to a true love with another individual, whoever that may be, is not to raise my defenses when I'm threatened, but to lower them. Isn't that interesting? So in other words, when I'm talking with a couple and they're mad at one another, they're both real good at raising their defenses and staying behind their castle walls and waiting for the other one to take and make the first move, right? And while they're doing that, what's the other person doing? The exact same thing. Is the conflict getting worse or is it getting better? It's getting worse. We're having more problems. And what, what Paul is saying here is he's saying, if you want to follow the Christ, there are times you're going to have to step out and be vulnerable to repair that relationship. And it's the last thing in the world that we want to do. Because I'm risking I could get what? I could get hurt again. But that's what he did here. And that's why this is so, this is so different from the way we're taught and we're brought up to believe. It's interesting, too, here. We'll throw this one in. Nowhere in these four chapters does Paul tell us what the issue was that these two women got crossways over. Isn't that interesting? I mean, think about it. It's an entire book of the Bible, an entire book about these two women who got a church that's all turned upside down, and we don't know what the issue was. I mean, were they arguing over pecan pie at the potluck? You know, it, it was a Jewish Roman church. Did one want Jewish worship and the other wanted Greco Roman worship? Was it an argument? They're two women. Was it an argument over the role of women in the church? You know, I was thinking about this this week. If this was written in my lifetime, we would have four chapters filled with here is the correct stance on this issue. Right? You know that's right. You don't have to answer me. I know it is. When I was an undergraduate ministry student at Abilene Christian, they brought in a gospel preacher who'd been preaching, I don't know, 40 or 50 years, and he was retired, to talk to us about ministering in the local church. I'll never forget his lesson to us. He walked in that day and he said, guys, let me tell you what. He said, you can do one of two things. And he showed us this single space list of a sheet of paper. And he read it to us, and it was a list of all the issues that the church had divided over in his lifetime. And he read it off to us. And he said, you can spend your whole life on issues. Or he said, you can spend your entire ministry on the cross of Jesus Christ. What's at the center of your theology? My mother was not raised Church of Christ. 
she was raised walking distance church. They were poor, and so she walked to the closest church in the neighborhood, which in Orlando happened to be around World War II, a Church of Christ, where my dad, who was a captain in the Air Force, was preaching on the weekends. And I'm not sure she fell in love with the sermons, but she fell in love with the preacher, and that was them. They moved back to Abilene, and Dad was teaching a county at ACC, and Mom needed a job. She went to work for the Highland Church in Abilene and became secretary to a preacher named E.R. Harper, who in those days was the lead spokesman against the current issue of the day, which was premillennialism. And Mom was typing out letters all over the Brotherhood and articles all over the Brotherhood about the evils and the dangers of premillennialism. And I have a letter that she wrote back home to her mother, and she said, quite jokingly, Hi, Mom. Two weeks ago, I didn't know and couldn't spell premillennialism. Today, I'm saving the brotherhood from it. <laughs> Paul is not so concerned with the issue. He was concerned about their relationships, and he was concerned that the center of their theology be the cross of Christ. Right? we got to move on. Let's skip to chapter 12. I'll do this one quickly. Chapter 12, excuse me, chapter 3 and verse 12. This is why I'm not an accountant. I don't get the numbers right. 3 and verse 12. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on to take hold to win the goal of the prize for which God called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The fourth thing that Paul tells us in this letter is it's going to take some time. It took some time for this little church to get crossways with these women. It's going to take some time to iron this thing out. It's not going to happen overnight. But what he says is, I need you to go ahead and get started. Now let me say a couple of things about that. Because he says right here, I, there's stuff in my life that I haven't gotten down. I'm still working on it. Two things about this. The first one is, the first step is the hardest. If Shailene and I are crossways about something, which we're not, but if she and I are crossways, with the, the, the first step in doing that is for one of us to make the first step. And that's the hardest thing to do. But invariably, what we've discovered is, if I will make that first step, nine times out of ten, the folks that I work with, what will the other person do? They're going to step toward me as well. Vulnerability, transparency, tends to breed transparency. Take it to the bank. It, it just does. We lower those defenses, the other person steps toward us. Here's the second thing. You don't wait Till you feel like forgiving to forgive, you get started forgiving even when you're not ready to. Because forgiveness is a point action and a process. I'll say it again. It's a point action and a process. I get people I work with all the time that have been harmed and hurt in some devastating ways. And they have to decide, I'm going to forgive. And then they work on that forgiveness every day from there forward. Right? So, I might need to be forgiven for Shailene, and she might be at 10% today. But she's working on it, and tomorrow she might work on it and be at 11%. And the next day at 12%. And the next day at 13 And the next day at 14 But the line is moving the right direction. I'll tell you another secret, too, that no one's ever shared with you, I bet. Forgiveness is... And unforgiveness can coexist in the same person, and you're okay. Did you know that? Sure. I can be with somebody that I'm chapped off at, but I still love them to death, and I'm working on forgiving them. Right? Haven't you had that happen? Of course you have. 
We don't have to be at 100% of forgiveness to get there. We can do it in stages, and that's what Paul's saying here. He's telling this little church, get started in the forgiveness process because it'll make you a lot happier, and you're going to get it on down the road. Let's keep moving. He says, fifth, chapter 3 and verse 17, Join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note on those who live according to the pattern we gave you. Listen to it again. Join with others in following whose example? Paul's example. And also, he says, take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. In other words, he's saying, I'm doing some stuff right, and I want you to emulate me. And there's some folks that I've sent you, there's some of his companions he sent back to Philippi, who were doing it right, and I want you to emulate them. What is he saying? He's saying, in conflict, you need to follow the peacemakers. You follow the role models of those people who do peace really well. Isn't that interesting? The church needs to be a place that platforms men and women who do relationships really well, who do peace really well, who do reflective listening really well. That's what Paul's saying here. Because what happens is when folks get torqued, when folks get crossways, in Philippi, when they got into this church fight, I can guarantee you the most dysfunctional knothead grabbed the microphone and turned everything upside down. Am I right or am I wrong? You've been in church, you've seen it happen. And Paul did too. That's why he's saying, I need the folks to speak to be the people that live by the Spirit, like I do and like the people I'm sending you. So what we say to folks is, I tell my therapist in training, I'll, I'll, we're starting a new semester, I'll have a class on Tuesday night, another class on Saturday, and I'll tell them, I'll say the first rule of psychotherapy is, you're in charge. You're in charge because everybody else in the counseling room is crazy. And somebody's got to be in charge that ain't crazy. And they all look at me like, oh my gosh, we're paying money for this? But yeah. And so it is then that Paul is saying we need the folks who do relationships well to be the models to guide this church. We continue. Let's go back to chapter 2 for just a second. He says in chapter 2, verses 12 and 14, Therefore, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, Continue to work out your salvation with what? You remember? Fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purpose. He's saying to him, I need you to walk into those difficult conflict resolution conversations. You know what it's like to knock on the door of somebody that's your enemy and they say, come on in, and you sit down and there's that awkward, terrible, poignant silence. You know there's an elephant in the room there that y'all both got to talk about, and it's tough stuff. Uodi and Syntyche had to have a conversation, and it was going to be tough but he needed them to be back in relationship with one another, and he needed to bring down the conflict in this church, and he needed that church doing stuff that was more important than pecan pie. <laughs> and that's tough stuff. Because it's the vulnerability of the cross, right? I'd kind of rather do religion, not Christianity, because this cross stuff sounds pretty tough to me. Right? I was working with a group of church leaders this past Wednesday night. 
doing a call with them. They were torqued with each other. Uh, they were having a fight. And they were all ball up and upset. And they all had stories and they all had hurt feelings. One guy wouldn't even get on the call. He put up his face saver. I think he was probably sitting there in boxer shorts, but I can't prove it. But they'd asked me, is there a way for us to get back in a relationship with one another because we can't lead this church because we can't even talk to one another anymore? Yeah. Yeah, there is. I gave him what I call the Lynn Anderson assignment. Lynn Anderson was a preacher of the Highland Church out in Abilene for many, many years, and he was one of my friends and mentors. And he told me this story one time. Lynn had gotten crossways with one of his elders out there. I know you've never heard of a minister and an elder getting crossways with one another, but it happened to happen that time. And it was so bad that they'd go into meetings and they couldn't even talk with one another. They disagreed about everything. They argued about everything. They didn't see things alike. Their temperaments weren't similar. They just didn't like each other. And it kept getting worse and worse and worse, and they couldn't get along with one another. And Lynn said that he'd be reading the Sermon on the Mount where it said, if you're offering your gift at the temple, and you go to give your gift and you have ought against your brother, what do you do? Exactly. And he was convicted by that, but he didn't know what to do. So he said, finally, he said, I called a guy up on the phone and he said, can you meet me for lunch? So they met for lunch and Anderson shows up with a yellow tablet and a pen. And he sits down across the table from this guy and he says, I know there's a lot of stuff about me and about the way that I think and the things that I do that you don't agree with. I need you to download that to me right now. And I'm going to sit here and I'm going to listen and I'm going to write down what you say and I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm not going to offer any defense. I am here to simply listen and write. And he did. And he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote, and he wrote. And this elder just downloading on him, just laid it out. And when he got through, he took his notes, he took his pen, he said, thank you, I'm going to take this, I'm going to pray about it, I'm going to think about it, I can guarantee you this has not been wasted time. And he left. He read that stuff, he looked at it, there was some of it he agreed with, some of it he disagreed with, and some of it he just needed to think a lot about. But here's the interesting thing. A few weeks later, he got a phone call from that elder. And that elder said, I would like for you to meet me for lunch. And this time, I'm bringing my pad and pencil. And I'm going to sit and what? Listen. And they did. And those two old boys became friends. They didn't agree on everything, but they were restored to relationship because they both followed the cross to become vulnerable. It's tough stuff. The toughest text in the New Testament, according to one of my teachers, Carol Osborne, is in chapter 4 and verse 8. The summation of Philippians is 4 and verse 8. It is the most important text in Philippians. It is, in my estimation, the most important text related to solving conflicts with folks. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is praiseworthy, what? Think about such things. 
Now, when I was growing up, we used to read this text and use it in devotionals to say, here's some good stuff for us to think about. Think about what's noble. Think about what's praiseworthy. Think about what's good and what's true and what's right. And that's really good. And that's a great way to apply this text. And we don't argue with that a bit. However, that's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying here is, when you think of that guy or you think of that woman that you're in conflict with, that person that just wrangles you, I want you to think about them this way. What about that person is noble? What about that person is good? What about that person is right? What about that person is excellent? This word excellence is only used four times in the New Testament. It's used one time here. Hard stuff. You mean I'm supposed to think about this person who has said these terrible things about me, who has done these awful things about me, who has shown no repentance and made no steps toward me to reconcile this. I'm supposed to change my thinking? Yep. Yep. I want you to put a positive spin on them and get that junk out of your head. Because it'll kill you and make your life miserable. And if they won't repent or change, you'll be the way to pay the price. Easy or tough? Tough stuff. Tough stuff. The interesting thing about the book of Philippians is we don't have the end of the story. Do we? Paul sends the letter back. You know when they got through reading this, that church that Sunday morning was really quiet. Because he had pulled out his big hammer and just whacked them on the toes for about 45 minutes. What we don't know is how they responded. Those two women could have said, yeah, I'm going to do that. you got to be crazy. I'm going to stop that. And the fight continues. And they went into round two. They could have decided, this is too hard. Uh, we're not going to do this. And so they just split and went their separate ways. Yodia took her folks and went one direction, and Syntyche took her folks and went another direction, and they hated one another for the rest of their lives and, and told stories on each other. And the folks in Philippi went, yeah, we knew those Christians didn't know what they were doing. Or... They did what sometimes conflict is given for us to do, which is we walk through the conflict into a new beginning. You see, sometimes conflict is given to old Don to get me to grow up because I got some growing to do. And in the conflict is found not an ending but a new beginning. And I choose the third to believe about Philippi. What about you? I think these folks decided we got some work to do and they made a new beginning. That's the book of Philippians. Paul says there's some things I want you to take a look at and I want you to do a little bit better. Next week, we're going to take a new direction with some of our talking. We're going to come back to some of the healing lessons a little bit, but I hope it's been a blessing to you. Let's pray together. Father, as we think about uh, your words to us, we pray that um, your spirit will speak into our hearts. We pray that uh, as we find ourselves in situations with um, friends and family and others that are difficult, that you'll give us a sense of peace for those relationships. Bless us as a church, Father. Bless this time of year as members are traveling and keep them safe. Thank you, Father, for all the ways you've taken care of us this year. Through Christ we pray and God's people said, Amen. Let's be standing as we say. this pain I wonder if I'll ever find my way I wonder if my life could really change
could have gone.